Thanks, Guy. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's great to see a lot of familiar faces again. And I'm truly proud to, to be able to share this time with you. Um, for the purposes of today's uh, panel, I'd, I'd like you to assume that in 2025, the Joint Force has realized the vision that has been articulated in the capstone concept for joint operations currently on the street. That vision is an operational concept called globally integrated operations. Uh, our panel today is, is focused on strategic mobility, and I believe that's the fundamental building block to the global agility that's so necessary for globally integrated operations to be successful. And I also believe that uh, global agility is a capability that will be more important tomorrow than it ever was in the past. Um, as, as the panel members talk to you today, I would like you to think about two questions uh, as they talk about their view of mobility for the future. One is, what, what makes a land force agile? In other words, what are the characteristics of agility that a land force, that you would look for in a land force? And then secondly, how might we assess global responsiveness before we're actually asked to go? As we think about the future, two questions that I'd just like you to kind of tumble in the back of your mind. Uh, I'll introduce our panel members, and each, uh, each member then will go in turn and give, give us a few opening remarks, comments from their specific area, and then we'll address questions as they come up. To my immediate right is uh, Major General Larry Weish, who's the chair of the panel, commanding general down at the uh, United States Army Combined Armed Support Command, has been there since uh, 2002. And Larry's going to kind of frame the discussion for us in, in a larger context. Uh, next to Larry is uh, Vice Admiral Mark Harnacek, Director of DLA, also since, I think, November 2011. And with the large operating global organization that he has, he's going to talk about uh, sustainment uh, at the strategic level looking in the future. And we have uh, Lieutenant General Judy Fetter, I think two down, who's the Deputy Chief of Staff for Logistics, Installation, and Mission Support at Headquarters, United States Air Force. Um, and her title encompasses her portfolio. She'll talk a little bit about mobility from an Air Mobility Command Transcom perspective. We also have Mr. Ken Weichel in the center, uh, retired Lieutenant General, uh, is president of NDTA, you all know him very well. He retired from the Army in 95. Ken's gonna talk to us a little bit about partnerships, specifically talking about visa and craft as we look to the future. We have uh, Major General retired Charlie Fletcher, president of McLean Advanced Technologies, who will talk to us a little bit about visibility uh, in transit visibility and other visibility as a necessity for future mobility. And down at the end, Brigadier General John Sullivan, who's the Army's Chief of Transportation, talk to us a little bit when he, when he gets his chance about developing leaders for that future environment. So without any further ado, Larry, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you, um, sir. Um, first of all, I'd like to just take the opportunity to uh, thank General Sullivan, um, General Swan, and the entire AUSA team. Um, additionally, I want to, in advance, thank the panel members for taking the time of their schedule to be here with us today, as well as our industry partners. Today, we're going to have a great discussion on strategic mobility. Um, we have done a lot of work in this area. We've made a lot of progress. However, to stay relevant, um, I do believe, as well as many others, feel that we have a lot more work to do. So what I'll do, i got three slides I'll quickly go through to put in context the discussion that we'll have. The first slide, I'll talk about the future operating environment. Go ahead to the first, sli first slide. And so when you look at this slide here, um, we will be dealing with uh, new as well as emerging threats uh, across the, the full spectrum of, of, the, of the globe. And I will tell you what we've experienced over the last 13 years uh, will probably be only part of what we'll experience over the next 15 or so, so years. Um, the, the future environment uh, will involve um, emerging threats uh, along the lines of a near peer, uh, regional and failing states, transnational groups, insurgents, and the list goes on. Um, additionally, um, future threats and opportunity could uh, arise from changing trends and resource challenges, shifting demographics, robotic, as well as technology, um, to include engineering and manufacturing, big data, cyber and space, power generation and storage. So what, I'm trying to, what am I trying to tell you? Is that the future environment will be very, very complex. 
But at the end of the day, we have to think about what is it going to take to get our force to point A to point B in a timely and efficient manner, ready to fight, ready to support with speed. Let's go to the next slide. What I just want to show you on this slide, the, the, the team has done a lot of work to look at how do we regionally align our forces to be able to support globally, uh, to support um, our Army forces as well as that Joint Force Commander. Um, our, uh, and, and the Army Materiel Command, the, uh, the G4 staff, and the entire community has done a, put a lot of thought into this. So we do believe that we are postured to support globally, ranging from our sustainment, theater sustainment commands, um, our expeditionary sustainment commands, our sustainment brigades, as well as the Army Field Services Support Brigades, uh, to include our transportation brigade. Um, other key players in this would be the Army Materiel Command, without doubt, U.S. Transcom Command, and the Defense Logistics Agency. You heard um, the, chief, um, the Vice talk earlier about, as well as John Mason talk about, the significance of the Army um, pre-positioned stocks. Those stocks will play an absolutely critical role in our ability to project the force. Um, and, and over the past years, our APS stocks has also played a critical role in the deterrence of future adversaries. So in APS stocks will continue to play a key role um, in the future. But again, we have to go back to the fundamental question, in my mind, do we have it right? And I will tell you, I think there are some things we can take a good hard look at as far as the makeup of the things in APS, look at our formations, et cetera, et cetera. I had the opportunity to go to Israel last week and spend some time with those, that team over there with a the delegation. And they are doing some new, unique things to tie their logistics network together that allow them to achieve effects quick and fast. And these are the things I think we got to think about, um, and while at the same time reducing the, the burden on the uh, supply chain. Um, so let's go to the next slide. And all I want to do is show you on this slide is that um, strategic mobility support our construct of prevent, shape, and win. And I want to highlight just two scenarios to give you something to think about. The first scenario is U.S. forces must assemble quickly, deploy, and conduct joint forcible entry operations from uh, extended distances to defeat an enemy somewhere in Africa. Secondly, um, U.S. forces respond to a HADR mission in SOUTHCOM, which requires them to conduct both port opening as well as theater opening while simultaneously providing subsistence power, and medical support. Now, both of these scenarios um, will need to address how do you deploy operational significant forces quickly, ready to fight, or ready to support. Um, these scenarios require extensive strategic mobility requirements with respect to airlift, sea lift, prepositioned assets, as well as support in general. And so we, what, we'll make, what we'll have to be able to do is project the force with speed that matters. Going into an A2, AD environment, um, at the same time, we want to reduce the reliance on ISBs and RSONI. So having said that, uh, just want to set the stage for the rest of the team um, to talk about how do we facilitate getting these soldiers and supplies to the fight to go there to support and or win. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to a very seasoned logistician, Vice Admiral Harnacek, sir. Thanks, Larry. Hey, thanks, everybody. Thanks to you, uh, AUSA. I almost feel like I'm in the Army now. I've been in so many of these things. Uh, General Swan, thanks for uh, asking me, Ray. It's good to see you. My old shipmate Jim Hodge is out there somewhere in the background, and then, of course, all of my esteemed uh, shipmates here in the room. Uh, let me just talk a little bit about, and I'm not going to talk real long because I'm looking forward to taking a lot of questions here. Uh, when it comes to mobility, I mean, my big concern is moving the two big commodities that, that, that I, I move. You know, we manage eight supply chains, but the ones that really are sort of uh, uh, 
uh, mobility hogs here are food and fuel. Okay, so what's right with regard to the movement of not just food and fuel, but all sustainment? Um, I think the pot's right with regard to strategic air. Uh, and Mike Williams and I studied this at least twice uh, in my joint staff and transcom days. Uh, Strat air is about right. We got about 300 heavy air, um, airlifters. Okay, that's on the gray tail side. Our partners in the Civil Reserve Air Fleet, we have on call in various stations anywhere between uh, 1,000 and 1,100 airplanes to move cargo and passengers. Uh, on the sea lift side, organically, we have the ready reserve force. That's 47 vessels of all types to move largely the Army, right? Uh, MSC has 12 of those uh, low to medium speed, uh, I mean, it's large medium speed roll on, roll off vessels. You can stuff an entire Army brigade into one of those. Uh, and then on the commercial side, we have the, the maritime security program, which is, has, has 50 vessels in it. And then the backup is that voluntary intermodal sea lift agreement, which has yet another 225 vessels or so. So I think from, from a machinery standpoint, the pot's about right. Uh, we do need to be a little concerned uh, with the Civil Reserve Air Fleet as that sort of cargo and passenger movement business uh, declines remarkably with the, uh, you know, the drawdown, the, the withdrawal in Iraq, and then, the, and then the, uh, the, uh, you know, the subsequent drawdown in Afghanistan. We need to watch that closely. But I'm pretty comfortable with the, the uh, machinery. I'm also pretty comfortable on the prepo side. Um, I think you guys are working that pretty hard in the Army. Uh, the Air Force has it about right, and I think the Marine Corps does as well. So there'll be continuing pressure there, but I think there's a great realization in the department beyond the logistics folks of the importance of you know, air mobility, sea mobility, and prepo. So you got the, the three-legged stool there. So I'm, I'm pretty comfortable there. And we've also not only studied that extensively, we've also experienced that. You think about things like Haiti, where we were Johnny on the spot in less than a week. Uh, things like Sandy, where we responded immediately. Uh, the tsunami and the earthquake in uh, Japan. Okay, then, you know, I mean, start knocking them off in Iraq. Uh, you know, multiple surges, the drawdown, uh, the movement of MRAPs, um, Afghanistan, you know, multiple surges there, multimodal operations in and out. So the machinery is about right. So I think, uh, you know, we've studied that to a fairly well. I think we've sort of uh, modeled that and experienced that ourselves in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, so I think we're pretty good on the machinery side. Where we're not very good, and uh, if I worry about anything, there's three things. The first one is access, uh, second one is infrastructure, and then the third one is sort of uh, options or flexibility. So, um, you know, all those machines really don't mean anything uh, if you can't clear the port, uh, if the road networks aren't very good, um, if the airfields aren't plentiful enough, they're not long enough, they're not air mobility friendly, uh, and uh, even if you have those, if you can't overfly and you can't get in, it just doesn't matter. So uh, for all of you Army logisticians anyway, and, and for me in my transcom days and again at DLA, uh, the biggest headache was not the availability of resources, of commodities, or the wherewithal to move them. It's all been about can we get it there. Uh, you know, we relied on Pakistan for a long time. That was a single point of failure. Uh, when we designed, our government writ large designed the Northern Distribution Network, uh, there's a reason we didn't call it uh, a G-lock, uh, because a G-lock implies you're locked in. Uh, we wanted to create a network, right, that um, was flexible, uh, that allowed us to exercise leverage, uh, that didn't rely on one single nation uh, for our access. And uh, when you think about operating in Africa, uh, any other sort of remote part of uh, part of the world we are, we are, where we are very likely to have to operate again, uh, that, that to me is the big worry. We can get it there, but if we can't close that you know, last operational and tactical distance, it really doesn't make any difference if you can get it close, but if you can't get it all the way there, you haven't completed your mission. And this is really an issue not just for you know, Transcom or me, it's an issue for everybody. It's a whole of government issue. So I th if I think we need to do any work, and it's hard work because it's sort of amorphous, it's nebulous, it's people don't see a lot of value in it like they see, well, let's buy some more C-17s. You know, people, there are no advocates in Congress or, frankly, uh, you know, in, in our civilian leadership that really are, get all liquored up about, you know, access and infrastructure. But boy, when you need it, you absolutely need it. So 
I think if we need to do anything in terms of, you know, homework here between now and, uh, you know, the immediate future, 2025 or so, uh, it's, it's figuring out where we're going to have to operate and then doing that hard work that discusses how do we close that operational and tactical uh, distance, um, how do we build a network here that uh, allows us to exercise leverage, not our potential adversaries or a network of, uh, or, or, you know, a couple countries that are somewhat unreliable partners that sort of Pakistan has uh, not proven to be, but, you know, some over, over the long haul of our relationship with them, it's been good, it's been bad, and right now it's not so great. So anyway, uh, so again, thanks for what you're doing. It's great to be back with the Army, and I'm looking forward to taking your questions. Thanks, Mark. Ken? Go ahead. Uh, could I have my first slide, please? Paul is bringing up the first slide. I'll just go ahead and start talking. But, but industry is certainly a key contributor to our nation's uh, strategic mobility. I mean, I think uh, kind of like Mark said, the, the platforms we have today are pretty much the ones we're going to have in uh, 2025. I mean, on the air side, uh, on the civilian side, it's going to be 747-800s. It's going to be the 787s, the 777 cargo aircraft, uh, certainly the Airbus. Row ships, and uh, then of course the mega container ships are uh, coming into the the market uh, today. Maersk has some already, and there's many more on the order of books from that. One thing out there that is new, that's kind of on the horizon, is uh, Ariscraft. I don't know whether you've heard that term or not, but uh, they're working on a hybrid airship, and uh, they've proved the technology and that uh, under a DARPA program, and so now they're looking to you know build uh, operating. Uh, craft, if you will, so they're looking for the investments for that. On the international and transportation logistics companies, I mean, they operate around the world every day. Uh, they're out there with their equipment, with the infrastructure, with the people, uh, and the networks uh, to get their commercial cargo delivered every day. Uh, they have contractors, subcontractors in place uh, to move their commercial cargo. So DOD uh, really needs to leverage that capability that currently exists. And uh, I was just talking to an international company last week. Uh, they operate in Africa quite extensively. They have 25,000 employees scattered throughout Africa. Uh, they operate some railroads in some of the countries. They have contracts for trucking companies. They lease and uh, contract uh, aircraft, uh, those types of things. Uh, some of you may have read, uh, I think, in the last week or two, where FedEx has bought a company in Africa so they can extend their reach uh, into the continent, uh, if you will. Uh, you may know of Damco. It's a Maersk-owned company, but they operate quite extensively uh, in Africa today as a 3PL. And uh, DHL, Kuhn Nagel, a lot of uh, international companies uh, operate not only in Africa but other places around the world. So the point is... They're there today, they're forward deployed, uh, they're serving their commercial customers. Uh, next slide. And as Mark kind of mentioned, there's, there's three programs that give us DOD access to the commercial market. Uh, the first is a CRAF program, uh, where the US airlines commit their airplanes to uh, DOD in return for the opportunity to compete uh, for government business. Uh, the next is the visa program, it's a little bit different than the CRAF program because the CRAF commits airplanes. The visa commits capability. It's their ships, it's the peers, it's the MHE, it's the cranes, it's the network, it's the IT. So they commit that to being available to the U.S. government, again, in return for the opportunity to compete uh, for government business. And then you have the Maritime Security Program, which is really about 60 ships the total visa uh, group, and uh, they receive a stipend each year so they can be competitive on the world market, but these are military useful vessels that uh, the government can get access very quickly. And now on uh, your left there, you can see the number of aircraft that's currently in the craft program and the number of vessels that's in the craft, oh, excuse me, in the visa uh, program. So this really saves the government billions of dollars in terms of uh, not having to make the capital investment in these assets, but yet the government gets access to them in an emergency. So what's the risk? 
I mean, uh, really what we've been talking about earlier today, I mean, it's readiness. How do you maintain the readiness of these craft fleets and visa fleets? Uh, because with sequestration, with declining budgets, there's really not enough government pasture and cargo business now to keep all of them in business. And so naturally they have to be profitable to stay in business. Uh, bankruptcies are really starting in the air side. I mean, uh, Evergreen Airline is bankrupt, they're out of business. World Airlines is bankrupt and out of business. North American Airlines went bankrupt, they're out of business. Uh, there are others that are teetering on uh, bankruptcy and going out of business. Uh, the sea lift fleets are resizing, downsizing, uh, reflagging their vessels because the cargo is not there. The pastures are not there for movement. So with the capability being reduced or lost because of the lack of the business, then readiness becomes an issue as we look out to the 2025 time frame. I mean, there's going to be airplanes there and there's going to be ships there. The question is how many of them? Will there be enough when we need them to meet the requirement that DOD has? And so this slide also just shows the logos of some of the companies that's in the craft program, the visa program, and so forth. Next slide. Really what you want to try to do is optimize your mix of uh, organic and commercial assets. And so if you had five MREPs, you need to get to Afghanistan in five days. You know, it pretty much has to go by air. So you have a couple of options there. Move it uh, by air into Manas and then shuttle it into Afghanistan by C-17s so or take it by C-17 all the way. Next slide. If you get more of them, you got 200 now and you got a little bit longer to move them in 40 days, then you have some other options. You can move them by ship partway into Rota and drive them across the road, basically, to the airfield and then put them on C-17s and shuttle them the rest of the way. Next slide. You're looking at taking the strikers out of Fort Lewis. I mean, you can rail them across the United States to Charleston, use the Multimoda into Rota, Rota as with the uh, MREPs, and then fly them in. Or, next slide, and go west into Diego Garcia and then shuttle them to Afghanistan. So the point is, I mean, you have options and you're trying to optimize the best mix of your commercial as well as your military assets to achieve the mission, if you will. Now, it's really a complex, difficult uh, process to go through to get this. I mean, it looks kind of simple as you just look at a couple of options there. Next slide. So really what you need to do, of course, is find out, okay, what's the origin? Is it coming from a depot? It's coming from an installation? Is it coming direct from the manufacturer? Is it coming from prepo? And then what mode are you going to move it on? Truck or rail to get it to your ports? And then, of course, what kind of assets within that mode do you need to select? Then what's the capability? I mean, Mark mentioned, I mean, how long is the runway? Uh, can it take the size aircraft you want to put this cargo on? What's the water depth at the port? What's the draft available? These large mega container ships that's coming online 40-foot drafts, it's going to take a deep port to put them into, as an example. Once you decide that, then what kind of strategic lift are you going to use? Air or sea, and then commercial or military, and again, the mix and the type of assets within that mix. And then finally, the capability of the receiving port, airport or seaport, to take that uh, asset, if you will. And finally, then how are you going to clear it and get it forward to the forward operating bases or distribution center? Now, that's just kind of the military piece of it as you look at it. Next slide. There's a lot of other factors that are involved here. I mean, what's the amount of supplies that's available? What's in your distribution centers? Do you have prepo? Where's it located? Uh, you know, what are your allies' requirements? They need to bring their stuff into the same airports and seaports. The non-governmental organizations, John Sullivan asked that question this morning about how to handle those. And the one I have in red there is probably the biggest one of all, politics. I mean, politics can override all of that. And uh, certainly Mark commented on it in terms of the PAC GLOC, how many times it's been opened and closed because of politics. Can you overfly the country? We wanted to go through Turkey to get to Iraq, right? But we weren't able to do that. So politics is a significant consideration when you consider strategic mobility and all the pieces that fit into that puzzle and trying to get your stuff from point A to point B to point C or the ultimate destination. Last slide. So what should you take away from here today? Industry is forward deployed every day. They're out there operating where we're going to go in one shape or another. 
These are critical programs, the craft, the visa, the military, the maritime security programs. So we want to keep those programs. It's really an insurance policy for us. So we need to invest in them, investing in them by providing cargo uh, business for these companies so they'll be there when we need them. And then, of course, we need to look at the laws, the regulations, and policies so that these support the efforts to sustain the programs that we're talking about, the craft program, the visa program, uh, and so forth. So thanks very much. Thanks, Ken. Next, uh, Lieutenant, Lieutenant General Fetter, Judy. Yes. Yes, uh, General Christensen, thank you. It's a, thank you again for the opportunity to be here. And uh, I've noted uh, General Christensen talked about me coming from the transcom perspective, but there's a lot more transcom expertise up here at the table than me. So I'd like to just address some uh, things from the Air Mobility Command, the iron side, and some of the capabilities that we're looking at as we move out towards the uh, strategic mobility requirements in 2025. And certainly we understand, you know, that there's a dynamic and evolving shift in how we will all rely on strategic mobility um, capability um, for all our fighting forces, and, and it's going to be uh, particularly noteworthy as we get into geographic areas where we do have an A2AD environment and um, the power projection for forces just becomes a lot more challenging. So if you move to the next slide, um, first off is, you know, lots of pictures of iron here and just a note on what our, our current strategic mobility um, platforms look like today uh, and where we're moving to. Up in the top left-hand corner, we have C5s. Uh, we're moving toward, uh, we have a fleet of 19 C5Ms, which is our C5, our enduring platform, moving to a force of 52. Upper right, you know, we, we bought 223 C17s. We have effectively 222 now. And then, of course, part of our strategic forces include our KC-10 fleet, 59 aircraft each, about 100 KC-135s, and then our KC-46 uh, strategic refuelers. And these, these compromise our mobility forces. And, you know, it's not, it didn't go unnoticed that uh, there's always debate and constant study about whether or not we have um, the capability just organically within the Air Force to provide for this uh, strategic mobility mission. We talked a little bit about the craft up here, and, uh, and you know, as we know it right now from the demand signal from the studies that have been done, uh, we have the fleet that meets the needs, but I think the conversations that we have in an environment like this where we're talking about, do we have the strategies right for moving forces forward into 2025, uh, and what does that do to the requirements as we know them today as represented here on the slide, and is that going to be adequate for the future? And uh, certainly, General Odierno's points that, you know, as the Army gets smaller, we don't need less strategic lift, which you could uh, make an assumption there. But, you know, his point is we need more because of the way that the Army is going to be picking up and moving. And, uh, and I, I think that goes for the Air Force, too, when we look at di different concepts of operations and presenting forces in a, a theater like the... Pacific AOR. So the numbers here, you know, they're they're what we're what we'll have by 2025 or 2028 for the KC-46. But uh, we're always um, understanding the constraints uh, that that these numbers bring us. Next slide, please. And you know, part of that, part of the using the iron for uh, strategic mobility across the globe, we're we're very reliant on our in route. Uh, support structure and in route strategy. And as uh, Amar Harnacek talked about, you know, it's access and infrastructure uh, and how we're able to get these mobility assets forward along with those fighting forces. So we have a, a very robust in route strategy. This may need to change by 2025, depending on where our focus is on the multiple theaters of operation that we're talking about. But we do have a strategy that allows us uh, different capabilities at different in route bases uh, for, to, to accommodate where we expect to be when and, uh, and how we're going to get these assets around the theater. Um, so if you move to the next slide, we're talking about some of the enabling concepts um, that will contribute to both the in route, in route strategy capability as well as other technologies and capabilities that we'll need in the future to meet strategic and tactical mobility requirements. And the first thing, of course, is setting the theater, going back to Mark Harnacek's points about um, access. 
and the infrastructure that's available um, uh, for those bases that we need to get to. You know, we talk a lot about uh, prepo, uh, just Air Force assets, Army assets, and one of the things that we're looking at specifically in the Pacific Theater is, you know, when we talk about prepo, there may be some key places where we need access to where we need to be building some coalition support. And what we may want to do or should do is preposition assets that are more for humanitarian assistance, disaster response type capabilities, um, and posture those uh, specifically for that, and then have them available for other type of contingencies should we need be. We're looking at, you know, how palatable is it um, to prepose some equipment in areas where we don't have it now. Uh, lighter, leaner, more agile, I think this is the key that, uh, in fact, Ray Mason and I were at uh, other uh, maintenance, DOD maintenance symposiums in the past, and we're talking about how all forces need to be focused on being um, more agile and lighter specifically uh, to get to, uh, for the, the use of strategic mobility. And in my mind, this involves TIFID reductions. It involves making sure that we have what we are what we need in that tip fed sequenced right, and looking for any way to reduce people, materiel, and support equipment that we need to move forward through the use of technologies, through the use of uh, different policies, different doctrines, again, going back to prepo, organic prepo, coalition-type support, anything that we can do to reduce the reliance on that, uh, that massive uh, tip fed requirement to get forces uh, more quickly is certainly one of the areas that, that we're looking at, especially towards 2025. And, it, and the last note there is just evolving TTPs and thinking uh, and the, thinking about how differently that we will present forces to the combatant commander. The first note up there is something that we're, we call rapid raptor, where we're demonstrating, as an example, the use of uh, one single C-17 to move a four ship of F-22s, and we've demonstrated this out of, uh, out of some of our Pacific forces, is instead of uh, building a plan where we have to move an entire squadron, what does it look like to move a smaller component of fighters with a single C-17? What do we get on it in terms of people, equipment, consumables, uh, ammunition, um, wh whatever we need to support that, C that F-22 small package operation for a limited number of days, uh, being able to move that aircraft in and use the have the C-17 there to support. Now, great concept, and we think that there's great utility in the force in the in the future, especially in theaters where we need to be more dispersed. Um, but of course, the, we we look at this and we say, well, our, and our AMC counterparts will say, you know, that may require uh, more C-17s then, or it may require a different type of uh, strategic or tactical airlift requirement if we're going to now be pairing some of these strategic mobility assets to smaller forces instead of just using them for strategic mobility. So lots of things to think about and focus as we adopt different ways of presenting forces to, uh, to this mobility requirement. Uh, and of course, um, evolving TTPs as we look to the future is to reduce that footprint to, to reduce to, and to reduce the re reliance on strat air. What can we do for reach back? Um, how can we uh, push smaller uh, forces forward? And how do we be more responsive once we, get in, once we get into the theater for mobility and being able to use the potential for unmanned platforms or for a lot more rotary lift for um, moving equipment forward for resupply or for that last tactical mile? So. Um, looking at all these kind of enabling concepts, and, and we fully understand that 2025 is going to bring uh, a, a lot of different ways that we as an Air Force need to bring that strategic mobility capability um, to our joint services. And so the discussion this afternoon and the questions that you have will be um, very enlightening and very helpful. So thank you for the opportunity. Th thanks, Judy. I, I really appreciate the comment uh, related to a smaller land force that's required to respond more rapidly and more in a more distributed way may require more lift than a large force that's more, you know, more kind of tip fit driven. And I, I think that's counterintuitive to most people's thinking. Most people would think that if the forces are smaller, you just need a correspondingly less lift. 
So I think that point is really very important. Thanks a lot. Uh, next, uh, General Fletcher, Charlie. Um, well, thank you for uh, the invitation to be here today. I think I was asked because I probably have screwed up in transit visibility more than anyone else in the Army. Uh, but I wanted to start off with a, a definition. What is it? Well, it's part of asset visibility. It's uh, the identity, the location, the quantity, and the status of assets. And what are assets? Well, they're everything. They're pieces, parts. Uh, they are pieces of equipment. They are people. They are units. It's everything that we move. I want to talk about this in the context both of my uh, Army experience, but also for the last six years I've served as the NATO Logistics Senior Mentor. So I wanted to give you a little bit of, of that perspective. So I started in the lower left-hand corner and thought I'd talk about uh, our history of in-transit visibility, starting with Operation Torch. General Eisenhower sent a letter to the War Department saying we need more supplies, and the War Resp Department responded back, it appears we've shipped everything twice and most things three times. So then you go forward a couple of years to the D-Day invasion, often used as the, as the penultimate uh, logistics planning operation. And they had to organize engineer support brigades to plow the equipment off of the beaches to make room for the next delivery. Desert Storm, Gus Pagonis writes a book called Moving Mountains, and in it is opening 30 to 40,000 containers into Mom to find out their contents. OIF and OEF, significant uh, investment in visibility at the strategic level, but difficulty in handing that off to the tactical level to get that end-to-end -end in transit visibility. So where will we be in 2025? Well, it, I think it's about how do you improve distribution? How do you improve your effect using in transit visibility? Next slide. So uh, the, I read a Wharton uh, School article that says, not not your school, but another <laughs> school, um, the real said one. if you're going to talk about distribution and supply chain management, you need to talk about Walmart. So in it, it said there are three keys to supply chain management, distribution practices, fleet management, and technological innovation. Distribution practices. Uh, Walmart was one of the first to reduce the, reduce the number of links and to really uh, make collaboration a part of their business model. And then fleet management. Where's my truck? Which actually was developed by uh, my predecessors at McLean Technology. Uh, it took 20 years ago, web application, uh, took the existing onboard technology of the truck, uh, started doing electronic data interchange and advanced shipping notice, and then fed all that information into the ERP of the customer and allowed the customer to see all this within their system in the way that they're used to seeing it. And this, re this uh, resulted in re automated receiving documents and being able to get your, your uh, workflow linked to the delivery schedule. And then as that moved forward from where's my truck, it allowed them to do away with warehousing because they could now cross dock from one truck to another and therefore reduce the amount of handling that they were doing. And then technological innovation. Uh, Walmart was one of the first companies to, to use a universal product code. So everything was marked the same way. And then they were one of the first users of this uh, automated identification technology, RFID in all its forms. And finally, they took all this once they had control of the data and they started moving it from ERP to ERP and sharing that data. And again, that helped in their collaboration as they moved forward. So by 1990, Walmart was making about $3 billion a month and was the retailer of the decade. Their distribution costs were 1.7% of their total cost of sales, their largest competitor, Kmart was 3.5, or twice as much that they were paying for distribution, and Sears was paying 5%. And then Walmart continued to drive that cost down, became more efficient, and was at $30 billion a month, the world's largest retailer by 2005. At that point, the Army was paying $15 million a month in detention on containers that they couldn't find. So here are two groups that are similar in terms of uh, their early use of AIT, their multiple stakeholders, their worldwide operations, they implemented it, and maybe the Army didn't do as well as the commercial industry has done. So there's maybe something to be learned from this. Next slide. So as we look to 2025, what's the operational environment? 
Uh, 15 years ago, I was in the Operations Center at Transcom and got a call that we needed to evacuate Americans from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. They have, uh, on a regularly scheduled basis, a coup, generally every other year. Uh, and, and so we have to stand up the, the infrastructure to pull all these people out. So we contacted, I called the, the British commander at Ascension Island, and we got the Special Operations Forces moving, and we called the 160th, and we got all this thing going. And then I got a call that all the Americans had been evacuated. The French and the Belgians had pulled out all of their citizens and all of our citizens before we could even establish the network to get in there. So I think coalition is something that we sometimes overlook, but it gets to driving down your footprint. It gets to people who are like-minded that want to accomplish the same ends that we do. Last week I was in Spain as part of a, uh, the NATO Response Force Headquarters validation. And the, many of the officers from Spain had just returned from Mali, where they'd spent six months with an EU force in Mali. So there are a lot of other players here that have permanent or near-permanent capabilities in places like Africa that I think we need to recognize as we drive down the footprint and increase our effectiveness. Uh, but there's also anti-access and limited infrastructure and cybersecurity and a bunch of of different things they're going to say, just having the data and having the access is not all that we're going to need in the future. And all the capabilities in terms of our aircraft are only as good as our ability to land them. So what are the, what's the technological environment looking to the right? Well, I found a, a very good article that talked about knowledge to the world. Internet access will be ubiquitous. Uh, we will move from storing data to streaming data that cloud computing and cloud-based browsers will be the norm in 2025. And that will, will achieve this data access that we don't uh, have today, but we, we uh, theoretically should be able to achieve. So that's on the information side, but if you look at the requirement side, 3D printing is the, it, it's called the future industrial revolution. You don't have to take it with you because you can produce it forward. And you take that and what the coalition brings, and maybe you can drive your requirement down. So as you look at a case study in cloud computing, because a lot of this talks about the data of 2025, the Army has already moved from legacy to a secure cloud with its property book system. And in the process, it moved uh, access times for major queries from 23 hours to three minutes. You have a much more secure environment, and you have an environment in which you can share data across your ERPs. Uh, so there's a lot to be said for where we're headed and what the, the technological capabilities will be. But these game-changing opportunities for improvement of access and situational awareness really are key to how do we improve our governance and our cooperation within the Army and the military, the joint force and the coalition force that we can achieve all the technology we'll be able to give us. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, and last, uh, General Sullivan, John. Sir, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, participate in the panel this afternoon. And I want to talk just for a, a few minutes about deployment readiness. Um, you know, as with the best of the strategic sea lift, with very robust strategic airlift, best ITV, all that, if you have all that in place, all that ultimately is for naught unless we have units that are trained ready to deploy and to move combat power from where it is to where it needs to be in a timely manner. And I think uh, kind of to frame the discussion up front, it's important to recognize that the environment in which we've been deploying over the past 12 or 13 years has some very unique and, and common characteristics. And some of those are listed on the uh, next slide, please, on the left hand of the slide there at the top. First and foremost, and this is generally speaking, uh, our units have had fairly long uh, deployment lead times. Um, they've deployed with uh, robust contractor support uh, that includes both uh, outload support at the respective installations as well as during the RSO&I process in theater. And for the most part, uh, the deployment processes, and I would just highlight Iraq as an example, for a unit deploying to Iraq, those processes were pretty much uniform, which is not to suggest they were easy by any means, but in terms of what a unit did to deploy to Iraq, the RSO&I piece on the other end and the movement of that combat power and personnel to its uh, final place in Iraq, pretty constant. I could take a group of junior leaders, uh, get them together, and kind of take them through that process, walk them through, and what I'll pose to them is this is how, irrespective of what unit you deployed in, 
uh, or what rotation you deployed in, I can pretty much describe the process those units uh, took to uh, deploy to Iraq. So what that's done, um, we have certainly a lot of experience now with that, but it's a certain type of experience. And in the process, there are some deployment skills that have atrophied. It seems counterintuitive uh, with the op tempo we've had and the number of deployments we've had over the last over 13 years, but there have been a number of deployment skills that have atrophied. In particular, unit responsibilities uh, for outload support at installations, kind of the blocking and tackling of how do you get a unit out of, uh, out of a garrison camp or fort quickly, um, kind of the Idri type of task that many of us grew up with uh, as we came up. So also the other kind of distinguishing factor between the environment that many of our junior leaders are accustomed to now and the one that we're moving to is that heavy reliance on TPE and theater. So from in OIF, for example, certainly from OIF 3 onward, units by and large deployed largely with containers, uh, not with all of their organic MTO equipment. So as we look now, looking forward, uh, and as we expect units to deploy in a shorter timeline, not in a rotational manner, not with long lead times, uh, possibly with all or most of their organic MTO equipment, an environment that does not have the robust contractor support that units have had heretofore. Um, it calls for uh, training a certain number of skills. And the Rapid Expeditionary Deployment Initiative is one step we've taken working in concert with the Army G4 staff, certainly uh, TRADOC and the Army G3 staff, to try to reinstill some of those basic expeditionary uh, deployment uh, skills and attributes that have attributed over the past uh, 12 to 13 years. So I won't go through all we have done. What I'll highlight, though, is the foundational work on Ready is complete, which is to say uh, the regulatory guidance on it, uh, certainly with respect to uh, establishing a command di discipline uh, deployment program, which provides unit commanders roadmaps of how kind of what right looks like at various echelons to be able to deploy in a more expeditionary manner. And uh, we've established a number of tools, an online tool that uh, has been, based on the feedback we've gotten, very successful as a ready toolbox, kind of an online depository, one-stop shopping for units to go to, to kind of get a sense of what right looks like as they attempt to begin doing things like EDRIs, uh, begin to deploy to combat training centers where uh, the deployment phase at their installations is being evaluated, that they're moving combat power to an ISB, and all of that is now being evaluated. It's not a panacea, but it's a first step that the unit movement officers, battalion S4s, brigade S4s, DTOs can go to to kind of get a, st a starting point and, uh, and to get after it. So in terms of leader development, as we look at, again, the environment that many of our junior leaders have now become accustomed to deploying and where we're going in the future, it's imperative that, number one, we recognize uh, that the conditions have changed. And number two, we don't take for granted, I think, some of those basic fundamental blocking and tackling type of uh, deployment-related tasks that perhaps have not been exercised uh, to the degree they needed to in order to uh, underpin our success going forward at deploying in a different manner, or being prepared to deploy in a different manner than we have. Just one data point before I, I move on to the next slide. Um, the EDRI program, which uh, recently uh, has been funded now and will uh, begin, I believe, in FY15, um, if I have a group of junior leaders together, majors say, uh, and I ask the question, how many of you know what EDRI stands for? Uh, by and large, a minority of those officers will even know what EDRI means. Much fewer of them will actually have participated in EDRI. So it just points to the fact that there, there are some critical skills out there that need to be retrained, and uh, we working collectively with uh, all of our stakeholders are getting after it. Next slide, please. I want to uh, kind of change frequencies, if I could, and uh, talk briefly about the role of Army watercraft uh, going forward. Um, in the recent past, many have consigned uh, Army watercraft purely to the sustainment warfighting function. And Army watercraft certainly has and will continue to play a huge role in the sustainment warfighting function, but it also has a role to play in the movement of maneuver forces, particularly intra-theater. And working with uh, the entire, uh, all the stakeholders across the enterprise, and in particular with our uh, partners in the Maneuver Center of Excellence, we have been working together to kind of socialize and, and 
make sure that commanders are aware, Joint Force commanders are aware of the capability uh, watercraft platforms play in the move movement of maneuver forces. We are working together on the, uh, a vessel which we hope at some point in time will replace our uh, landing craft mechanized uh, fleet. The LCM-8s are about 42 years old now, and we're working to uh, go to a next generation of vehicle uh, vessel uh, dubbed the maneuver sport vessel. So we're working, in, and as we look toward the rebalance to Asia Pacific in particular, we see a growing demand signal for the capability that Army watercraft brings to that AOR in particular. Sir, that's all I have. Okay, thanks. We've got a couple questions here. Uh, we'll take these, and if uh, there's anything else you want to ask from the audience, please don't hesitate to stand up and interrupt us. First one is for you, Judy. Um, Assuming that we believe we need to keep the C-17 line warm, what, what strategies would you envision uh, to keep that warm base? And then the second thing is, the second part of that question is, would you support or do you support doing an MRS? And I'm not sure what an MRS is, but. Yeah. So the. Oh, that kind of an MRS, okay. The, the first question had to do with, could you repeat that? C-17, right. warm base. Warm base mm -hmm. for the C-17? For, for continued production yep. of the C-17? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, um, if I got the question right, it is what do we need to do to make sure that we can keep the line warm? Yep. Okay, well, I, you know, should, that, should the decision be made to um, uh, add the C-17 back into the acquisition um, uh, program? I, you know, we, we've done that before. We did that with the F-22. We know how to work with the OEM to uh, on the production line to uh, retain some of that capability to be able to reopen the line. I think that uh, we all recognize, though, that that's a very expensive endeavor and that the, um, uh, the, the smart way to do this is to really understand how many that we need and procure them while the line is still open. I mean, I don't think we can afford to do that otherwise um, across the Air Force. And so that gets a little bit into the uh, second question, which was... Mobility requirement study. About the, right, the mobility requirement study. And, and the, uh, the Transcom leads that, of course, there was a mobility capability assessment that was done last year, which could lead into another um, cap uh, requirement study. And I think that's really the tool. And I, th that's really the tool when we look ahead at what those uh, mobility requirements are going to be is... I think we've seen that as those studies have been done, and Admiral Harnacek is certainly well versed in these, that, uh, that they evolve and, and requirements change, and that's really what's going to be the, the demand driver for decisions for acquisition of additional strategic assets. I, I suspect the question came from somebody who believes that 222 C-17s is not enough. <laughs> well, uh, let me follow up on that, and I, Mark, you can probably address this, because the point you made earlier, Judy, about a, a, a smaller force that has to deploy more quickly and, and in a more distributed manner across the globe may require more lift capability. So in the way we've done those uh, capability studies in the past, we've used numbered op plans as kind of our driver for that. But if, if the future is, is very uncertain, how might we envision a capability study that would encompass some of that. In other words, how do we know that we need more lift assets for smaller forces? They have to move faster in a more distributed way. Any thoughts from anyone on the panel? Yeah, the, the real, I mean, when Mike and I did these consecutive studies on the joint staff and then when I was at a transcom, the big difference was what it is that we studied. Uh, and, and one of the assumptions was in the first one was this sort of, uh, this notion of a near simultaneous major combat operations. So you'd be heavily engaged in one, you'd sort of, uh, you know, swiftly defeat the efforts, win decisively, then 30 days later you have to go do the same thing again. That requires a lot of machines. And the mobility, the strat air requirement was much larger in the first study than it was in the second study where we didn't have that requirement for near simultaneous, um, uh, uh, you know, major combat operations. So when there's a significant degree of separation between the two, you need far less lift, and that's just the arithmetic. Um, that's what allowed us to transfer 50 or so C-5s to the reserves and not modernize those airplanes. So it all comes down to what it is that you study, because once you decide, you know, where we're going to operate, uh, what the likelihood of it will be, what will be the sort of duration, uh, the amount of force structure involved really determines 
what the mobility uh, requirement is because the rest of it is just spreadsheet arithmetic. You know what has to move, you know where it has to move from, you know how fast it needs to get there. So the rest of it is just an arithmetic exercise. So if we're going to, Chris, to your point, uh, a much smaller force that needs to move much more quickly and in a sort of more near simultaneous fashion, uh, that's what you need to convince the folks in OSD policy that we need to go study, not something else. Thanks. Um, this next question was addressed to you too, Judy, but I think, Ken, why don't you take it on first, then Judy, if you want to follow up, that's good. Um, as the air cargo carriers move to 787 and 777 belly cargo in lieu of dedicated cargo planes, uh, how might we adjust craft or what would be the impact on craft? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. It's certainly one that the uh, all cargo carriers are kind of dealing with today. Uh, a year ago, uh, those involved in the analysis of the air cargo market uh, felt that there would be a decline in uh, the requirement for all cargo aircraft because the new passenger aircraft coming on board have much more belly space. So they would take a certain percentage of that away from the all cargo guys, maybe 10 to 15 percent. Then you get the integrators, the FedExes, UPSs, DHL, uh, they draw a little bit away. They get another 2 to 5 percent. So there was considerable, uh, I guess you'd say, seepage or leakage uh, out of the all cargo market to those belly uh, aircraft as well as the integrators. But over the last uh, few months, it appears that the air cargo market has stabilized somewhat. And I think they've probably reached the, the bottom of terms of diversion of cargo, and they may start building back up or growing slightly. Uh, but I think the worst is probably over. But that has impacted uh, the all cargo guys. Judy, any, uh, any comments? I, I, I would offer that on the organic side, you know, as we look at the uh, – um, the Air Force fleet, and specifically what we looked for in the KC-46, that it, it really does go back to a balance of ensuring that we have uh, aircraft that can do all cargo, or we have platforms that uh, we can we can move people, cargo, and refuel. And there there's a there's a knee in the curve there where we can ensure that we don't have too much of one or the other that, and again, that complements the craft fleet. Um, so, it, you know, going back to Admiral Harnacek's point and the studies that are done um, to make sure that what our fleet represents the, the most effective mix of those kinds of organic fleets and the, the uh, um, lots of decisions and uh, factors that go into making sure that we can do that. And, it, and it, it really does go back to what is the requirement for the moving the joint forces in the time that we need to get things moved. Okay, thanks, Judy. I think we're up against our time window. Uh, I'd like to personally thank each of the panel members again for taking your valuable time to being here, and thank you, ASA, for supporting this. Thank you very much. <laughs>